and we're live welcome back to another episode of the i filmmaker podcast my name is ariel martinez it's been a while since we've done a live episode today we have a fun one for you guys but before we get to that just want to let you guys and remind you guys that we are live on our youtube channel over at i filmmaker uh youtube channel uh so make sure you're subscribed get notified and uh turn on that bell whatever you call that so make sure you're there uh today we have matt johnson how are you buddy yes yeah, so glad to be here man yes. always good to talk gear and everything else and everything else today we have some awesome gear announced but before that like what's new with you um it's the summer so weddings in texas slow down a little bit for me for wedding filmmaking because it gets oh, too yeah. hot so it's like nine it's 97 out now about Ooh. and so people are like no there's no need to get married right now so like july and august weddings uh don't happen as much which is a relief for me um so i've had time i just released a course all about how i edit wedding films that's been doing well yeah it's awesome all right yeah and how long did that take you to make i started it in early 2018 and I finally released it mid 2019. So that kind of tells you um, it's About a year and a half. It's been ridiculously Probably. long. Yeah. My goodness. And it's tell, t tell me more. Tell me more about it. Like what's what's inside the course? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So it is all about how I edit wedding films in Adobe Premiere Pro. So it is literally like my entire workflow from beginning to end with me editing um, quite quite in depth, I will wow. say. Uh, it's over 24 hours of video, 38 lessons. It just is me going through editing an entire wedding film. And so what's cool is that if, if you're new to wedding filmmaking, if you're new to editing a wedding film, you can literally open up this, you can get, literally get this course and you can open up Premiere even if you've never opened it up before. And by the end of the course, you'll be an expert in Premiere and know nice. every single step that I take whenever I edit. Um, if you've already been editing wedding films for a while, um, I still feel like with me having nine plus years of experience here now with Adobe Premiere, I'm going to be able to show you some stuff that you don't know and some ways that you're going to be faster and more efficient. And especially from a storytelling standpoint, from that creative standpoint, I the way that I do it guarantees that I don't have creative block. I'm not getting stuck in an edit like, oh, I don't know what to do next. Oh no. Like I've built this framework out, this process for how I edit. And so even if you've been editing weddings for a while, but you find yourself getting stuck, you can buy this course and I'll show you how to get unstuck, which is really cool. Wow. And on average, how often, how, how fast does it take you to make a film? I assume it's different maybe every sure. project. It, it depends on the length of the film, of course, but right. I can knock out a shorter film. Granted, this is with like my schedule and with us having a child now. So it's uh -huh. all a little up in the air. Nice. Um, but um, usually about a week for like a, a highlight length, like five minute film, a week and a half for a longer film. Mm. I would approximate roughly. Interesting. Interesting. And uh, you, you've been having good, uh, good uh, feedback on the, on the courses so far and it's been doing well. Yeah, yeah. There's been people, I haven't even been asking for testimonials, but there's literally just been people that have been posting about it or sharing, and they're like, this is changing the way I edit. This is amazing. <laughs> like, I'm like, okay, great. That's really awesome. Um, and it's that's been like really encouraging. You know, you work on something for a year, year and a half, and you're not sure how people are going to take it. You're like, I hope, I hope this is good. I hope I'm not just overthinking this here. Yeah. And it's been so great. I think that's so natural to overthink things, especially putting out something like this that took you so long. You want people to like it. Sure. You know? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, we, as creative people, we put out any work, you know, you put out yeah. a corporate piece you've done. You're like, I hope this is good. I hope this works <laughs> well. Like, I hope they like yeah. it, you know, and it's, there's a pressure there. And especially whenever it's like your baby that mm -hmm. you've been working on for so long, you're like, yeah. I hope this works, especially if you're charging for it. You're like, I hope people oh, actually want to buy this and it's valuable. Yeah. Um, yeah. There, there's definitely some sort of pressure when it comes to uh, the the price tag of certain mm -hmm. projects. You know, when you got it, when you got a nice big budget to work with, you get even more nervous. <laughs> At least I do. I do. Well, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. Where can people find this, uh, the course right now? Yeah, that the course is at weddingfilmframework.com. But 
Ariel has an affiliate link that I gave him. So don't don't just type in weddingfilmframework.com. Use the link I gave Ariel. <laughs> all right. I'm gonna obviously I'm gonna put all the, the that link over in the show notes for this episode. That's super cool. And I was actually skimming through some of the videos. Dude, you know what? I've learned a lot from your even just your your um, your your YouTube videos, your YouTube channel. Yeah. You know, a lot of people like the other day, people had were asking me. Um, and it's funny because this was a topic that you and I were talking about, and we talked to Francis of Adobe mm -hmm. about this. Um how we export videos but sometimes when you're coloring when you're coloring the export will come out washed out and yeah. even i've had that issue and you made an awesome video fixing that issue it granted it's a it's basically a band-aid to the issue because yeah. i know adobe needs to they kind of you know it'd be better if they would fix it so that we don't have to go through these steps but sure. it's nice that at least we have a fix for now so that's yeah. cool I've, I've built a lot of my YouTube following on showing people the band-aids for Adobe products <laughs> and things like that. So I, oh, I'm, man. they should, I, people are staying with Adobe because of you. <laughs> it's funny. I've actually had people comment that they were like, I was about to leave for final cut, but then you showed me how to fix this. And so I'm going to stay. I'm like, okay, cool. Whatever. That's great. That's hilarious. It's, it's been a, it, it's quite funny. Cause I've had, that specific issue of people having washed out exports. I've had people email me. I probably have 20 or 30 emails over the past two years. I get like one a month or so, one or two a month of people like, hey, uh, my colors are washed out. They're faded when my exports in Premiere. Like, can you help me out with that? And I had no idea how to do it. And so whenever we met Francis at NAB, he's like, what, yeah. what issues do you have with Adobe? What are people talking about? And I was like, well, there's this washed out <laughs> color thing. And he's like, oh, yeah, I know all about that. Let me let me explain it to you exactly why it's happening for 10 minutes. So I was like, this is great. And then a month later, he emails me and he's like, hey, here's our fix. And so I was really glad that I was able to share that with people that That's especially awesome. all these people that have had that issue for such a long time. It's it's really makes me happy. Yeah, no, totally. And I, I get those questions probably not as frequently as you do, but I get that question, too. And I actually uh, I would send your link to them and uh, where they can see it, and they're super happy about that. So consider that more questions in 30 because <laughs> other people are probably still asking. Oh, That's yeah. awesome, man, just things like that. And uh, you know what I haven't used? That uh, that new feature that Adobe released, and they announced it the week of NAB. Um, have, you, have you been able to play with that? Like removing things from the video? Oh, the uh, content whole... aware fill for video? Yeah. I, have I have not had it. <laughs> I haven't had as much of a chance to use it as I wanted to. Like gotcha. I've, you know, like, oh, it's there in After Effects. Sweet. That's awesome. It's for me, I, the issue is more so that uh, I, I only open up After Effects at this point if there's like a need for it. Mm -hmm. So I haven't had an edit where I'm like, I need to remove this thing. Okay, right, let's do right. it. Uh, once, once I hit that point, then I'll, then I'll do that. But After Effects, even though I've used it for years, it still is. I mean, it's a sandbox. It's just a massive problem. Like, what do you want to do in it? You can do anything. <laughs> and yeah, you're like, much. anything? Yeah. <laughs> like, so it's, uh, you really have to know what you're doing before you. It's like going in there and picking out grains of sand on the feature that you want to use. <laughs> it's just so many things, which is a good thing. Um, and <laughs> I have, it's funny because I have friends that they're not video creators or anything like that. And, you know, they'll ask me, Hey, I want to learn how to edit video. Should I use Premiere? I hear that's the one that everyone's using. I'm like, no, don't use Premiere. You don't want to do this for a living. You're not getting paid for this. This is way too much for what you need. So sure. um, if they have a Mac, I'll tell them just use iMovie. Like if you're just clipping yeah. videos together, just use iMovie. Um, if you want a little bit more elaborate, I'll tell them to go get DaVinci since it's mm -hmm. free. They could just use that there. Like there's no reason to, to step into the Adobe world. If it's you're just so funny too, because people are always posting it. What should I use? Oh, I need something free, blah blah. blah. And I'm like, literally, DaVinci is free. Oh, and absolutely. There are tons of like people that I know that are complete professionals, and they're like, yeah, that's what I use all the time. It's great. Mm -hmm. I'm like, crap, I need to. <laughs> like, yeah, that's, that's pretty sick, what are you man. doing? That's pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. That that that's still that's still a thing. Like. I don't know what they use. I'm not very in tune with the whole Hollywood scene. But I do know that pretty uh, a lot of people use um, 
Da Vinci to color like some yep. high end movies. I'm not sure if you know to what extent, but yeah, I know it's, it's a big deal. It's getting more popular with editing. I know that for color, yeah. it's one of like the standards for color. Right, so right, right, right. No, yeah, they're yeah. upping their game. They definitely are. I, I really enjoy, liked it when they added. Uh, one thing I really like, and maybe you can answer this for me. One thing I really enjoy about Da Vinci is the fact that when when I'm editing, um, so when I'm editing the audio, it actually edits the wave files, right? Mm. So. I can bring an audio in there. I don't know if Premiere does that in the regular timeline or how that works. If I'm when I'm when I'm touching up the gain and whatnot, and mm -hmm. is it touching up the the wave file or does it have some sort of compression when I bring it into the timeline? Like that's something that I, I was wondering about. Are you asking if it's permanently modifying the the audio file itself, or are you asking if it's you're editing a different? Well, I, I feel like I have a lot more flexibility in audio when it comes mm. in, in DaVinci. So when I'm I'm touching up the gains, I really enjoy using it more in DaVinci. I feel mm. like um I feel like uh and I and, and I see it on the on the actual clip. It's it's touching mm -hmm. up the waves. Um I don't know if it does because all right, so I, I know it's getting a little complicated. So <laughs> in, in the timeline, I know that I can touch up the gain on 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 yeah. Premiere, right? I can I can hit the gain and I can also just hit that little bar and just mm -hmm. go up and down on the actual clip. I don't know what the difference is on those. I feel like the gain is actually modifying the clip itself as gotcha. for as for the the you know the bar on the actual timeline clip is not so much I, i'm not sure what the difference is on it's those. my understanding that the gain uh that the bar is just a representation of the gain just a visual representation of it so that's one one method for you to be able to modify it like one of the nice things about premiere is that you have like 10 ways to do anything mm -hmm. it's kind of like up to you you're like oh i can modify it with the bar i can open up the essential sound mm -hmm. panel and i can edit things in there or i can go yeah. over to the other panel and yeah. do it this way like you have so many different ways to do it or you can just send it over to audition and yeah. doing there too. Yeah. And well, I can, uh, the thing is though, the bar is limited. So you can go up maybe, mm -hmm. I don't know how many decibels. You, you can only can, go up six decibels with the bar. Six, six decibels. Yeah. And then with the gain, you can blow mm -hmm. that thing out, you know? <laughs> um, I don't know. I, it just seems like I have way more control mm -hmm. on in DaVinci. And I think that's part of the Fairlight software yeah, that they introduced mm -hmm, which is very high end they've they've yeah. been doing some really good moves i will say and I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was better or smoother or easier to use that that would not right, surprise right. me no i really did enjoy that part so that's something that is a plus for me with da vinci i think little by little i'm still kind of <laughs> switching over i'm just still i'm just so fast with premiere at this point where it's just a you know i'm just shortcuts everywhere you know and that's uh, how it happens, man. Like you get you get stuck in your one thing, and you're like, "I'm gonna do this," you know. And I get people all the time tell me, "Oh, you should switch to Final Cut," and then I'm like, "Yeah, but then I have to pay for a Mac." You know, it's just like ah, I don't know. If, okay, maybe yeah. well, it's just funny. It's real funny. You know what actually helped? And here's a little quick shout out to Editor's Key. As soon as I got this keyboard mm -hmm. from Editor's Key, I found out a lot more uh, shortcuts that I was missing out on. It's a it's a very pretty keyboard too. I will say I'm like, oh look at all the colors. Oh, that's nice. That's great. <laughs> yeah, they're they're a great company. It's very pretty. Yeah. No, no, I, I really enjoy it. Um, yeah, it definitely helped me out too. So shout out to them. They were cool people. So um today I figured we'd talk a little bit about the way we both do work, right? Yeah. So you as a wedding filmmaker, you deal with a lot of clients that are very um, you know, individuals as I usually call them individuals. Um, and I usually work with corporations. I work with businesses and whatnot. And I'm not a big fan of working. I mean, I'm, I don't really do weddings, but I'm not a big fan of working with individuals. Mm -hmm. I prefer to work with an established business. Mm -hmm. And obviously you, you're, you're quite the opposite. Not that you don't like working with corporations, but you're basically your, your niche, yeah. your, your trade is working with individuals. And I mm -hmm. figured we can, Discuss that today. See what the pros and cons. What uh, your experience, my experience is working with uh, these kinds of clients. Yeah. I think so that's great. 
I guess to start off, like, let's go ahead and start off with you, how you started, right? Um, yeah. Did you always start making wedding films? Did you uh, tell me about your experiences working with corporations and how you basically transitioned to only working with uh, non-commercial clients? Yeah, definitely. Um, so it's funny because I feel like for for me and then probably for you too and for most filmmakers, when you start out, especially in freelance, you're literally saying, I will do anything. Like I will, I will film it <laughs> yeah. all. Like, that's great. Yeah. Just, is it yeah. paying? Okay, great. I will be there. And so yeah. I started off and I filmed promo videos. I filmed promos for photographers, promos for uh, my university. I filmed um, music videos. I filmed random ads. I, and then like, then finally some girl in one of my class, I'd been filming just random stuff for two years. And then some girl in my class was like, Hey, I'm getting married. Will you film my wedding? And I was like, okay, cool. I'll do that too. Uh -huh. And so for many years, um, I, I would say that I didn't actually really start specializing in, in weddings, like full time, like only weddings really until 2016, I would say about like, it's only oh, been like three or four years. Oh wow. Um, cause, and, and even in 2016, I only had done like one, one or two corporate things. So I, I had trimmed it back significantly on like the corporate side because I, I find that if you want to be professional at something in general, like you need to specialize. Um, and I found that, Hey, well, not as many people are specializing only in weddings. Let me do that. And that's been really beneficial for me, I think to say, okay, this is all that I'm doing, but now I know how to do it really well. Right. And that's been good. Do you try to shy away from commercial clients or? Um, not necessarily, but I will say that commercial clients are a different, it's a different <laughs> sort of beast entirely in that, whereas you, you say you enjoy working with commercial clients, which I, I don't mind working with commercial clients, but one thing that I like about wedding filmmaking, I'll say is there is a pro to only having two people that you really need to make happy being the bride and the groom usually so true so, so true. Okay. um the so couple getting married you really only have to make them happy and so what i ran into a lot oftentimes never doing corporate work is you get into the design by committee issue where <laughs> yes. you're like okay i made this video for you and then like somebody in the back janice in accounting is like can we change <laughs> this one thing because this so I, I, say, I did a promo <laughs> video for a um a uh, company back in the day. And I think I had 13 revisions on that oh video my God. and it just kept happening. Hey, well, <laughs> let's make one more tweak. And then, uh, so finally at one point I was, I was very new at yeah, that yeah, point. Yeah. I don't been filming for two years. And I was like, I'm done. Like this video is done. <laughs> is it? it? You want to do it? You can change it yourself. I'm done. Cause I wasn't even charging for those revisions. Um, oh wow. So, okay. Yeah. And so I feel like, you know, as you get better, you're like, okay, we're going to charge for revisions now. And there's a lot more work to be done, but, um, I think one thing that's very similar between wedding filmmaking and commercial filmmaking even, or uh, as you put it, co corporate versus like consumer filmmaking is it's really all about educating the client. Mm -hmm. Like you're just showing them, this is how we work. This is how we film. This is the product that you'll be receiving. Here's how you'll be receiving it. Trust my creative vision. Yeah. Let me do what I'm doing be happy with what I've made kind of thing, ideally. I feel like that mostly flies only with consumers though, like consumer clients or non-commercial clients. Um, you know, and depending on the size of your commercial client, like, or a corporate client, uh, you know, there, there are times where I get jobs where my client has no idea what they want <laughs> and they rely on me. At the same time on their end, they have like 20 cooks in the kitchen out there critiquing this video that I made. But then there, on the other hand, there's also, also much bigger clients that come in with even a storyboard that they put together themselves and they're fully ready to get this going. They know exactly what they're looking for, where I literally just have to go set up the camera, the lights, everything else, and just hit record. And yeah. they know exactly what they want. And they give me a, a full breakdown on from this time to this time to show this shot. And that, I mean, it helps me do my job a lot better. Sure. So there's there's a variety of different kinds of corporate clients. You're absolutely <laughs> right. And then in weddings, I mean, you really can't do that so much. Like in weddings, you sort of have to get creative on the fly, don't you? Yeah, it's... I'm, I mean, I'm sure you can have some sort of plan together, but... <laughs> weddings are simultaneously 
complete chaos, but it's more of a control. I would say it's like a controlled chaos. Right. In that you can just like with any sort of filmmaking, you can put in a lot of work in pre-production to prepare for things. So that way you're never surprised on, on the day. Ideally. Um, my goal going into a wedding these days is I want to know everything that's happening. I want to know when it's happening. I want to know who's doing what. So that way I'm not showing up and then halfway through they're like, Oh, we've decided to change the whole reception. And you're like, wait, I was not ready for that. Um, there are still circumstances outside of your control. The weather can change. Things like that can totally screw things up. But um, much like in, in, even in like a corporate shoot, the more pre-production you do, the better that you're going to be, the safer it's going to be. Um, Yes, there will still be a ceremony. There will still be a reception. Usually, like the couple is going to kiss at some point. That's going to happen. But at the same time, weddings can still be this really unique event that can really be offer a lot of creativity. Because I find that with weddings, especially, I don't have really as many constraints with the couples that I'm getting these days. They're just like, we trust you. You know what you're doing. Make us a good mm -hmm. video. And so I'm able to be like, okay, great. Let's do some weird stuff. Like let's go run around and do this sort of thing. And it, yeah. it usually works out pretty well. That's good, man. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, I, yeah, I totally get that, that that's a, it's kind of good and bad on all situations, you know, sure. but you know, you, they're trusting the more experience. I assume the more experience you have, the better idea you have on just about every wedding that you do. Um, which is also a good thing. Um, an another thing that kind of, I guess, turns me off about not weddings per se, but mm -hmm. uh, just working with individuals is the whole like, oftentimes their their budget is just not there, you know, and and then I have to I'm subject to whatever they can pay out of pocket, and it it, it sucks negotiating like mm -hmm. with, with corp with corporations and you know, clients, they they already have a budget. They have something to, uh, to, to kind of, to, to give, they, they know usually what it kind of costs, you know, there is some kind of, um, there is some sort of friction every now and then, but not so much anymore, mm -hmm. uh, which is another thing, you know, and yeah, that's why I, I, I care more towards, uh, corporations, obviously that, and you know, my own, my own, uh, my own passion project. One of the funniest things that, um, uh, cringe worthy things I would say when people, when people tell me, um, and these are, you know, acquaintances that, that, that uh, I come across, you know, they'll tell me, um, Hey, you know what? I had this idea for a video. <laughs> That's a trigger moment. Hey. for me. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I have to sit there. It's like, okay, I have to look interested, you know, and mm -hmm. I have to make sure that I ha I give no hints that I'm making that video for them. Mm -hmm. um, and then another one is the same thing, but sort of different. You know, hey, I wanted to shoot this video. I want to shoot this video. Whenever they say me, mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. you know, uh, things like that, it, it means that they're going to want to try to get me to make a video and they're going to try to pay me out of pocket and they're not going to be able to have my, you know, um, fill it. You know, they're not going to have that kind of budget, you know? Sure. So that's one of the things you ever, you ever come across that? <laughs> uh, my, it's funny because my, my friend, uh, Will Backy, he does, uh, directing of indie films and things like that. He's very talented. Hmm. And he, I was talking to him about that a few weeks ago. He called me and he was saying, saying how he's working on this new indie film project that he's creating. And the whole concept of it was, he always has people asking him like, Hey, can I act like, Oh, Hey, I want to be in a movie. Like, Oh, Come my on. cousin's a good actor. My cousin, like, Oh, he just lives in Austin. But like, if you moved to Hollywood, he would make it kind of thing. <laughs> and he always has people asking, you know, can you make a movie? Blah, blah. And so finally he's like, fine, fine. Here's this movie I'm going to make. And he's like, this is your chance. If you are, have any sort of acting aspirations, if you've been wanting to do it, if your cousin wants to do it, like, you can come be an extra in my movie. This is your time. We're doing open casting. Come be in this movie. And so he had all these people like, yeah, it's finally happening. And he's like, fine. Hopefully people will leave me alone now about it. That's this so is funny. the one chance that you have to be a part of this. And I mean, he made it. I mean, I think he's done. He made it like by the end of June. So, hey, it's done. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, it's a good opportunity. It's for extras. So sure. sure. How, yeah. how bad can you mess up something with extras? Yeah. 
Exactly. And I, I will say, I feel like for, for me and you, especially anybody filmmaking, once you've been doing this for a few years, you can immediately pick up on if somebody's going to ask you to do something for free. or for a <laughs> it, It's like your friend calling you from a while ago and you're like, this is either going to be them asking me to make them a film or it's going to be asking me to join their pyramid scheme that they've become a part <laughs> of. And they're like, hey, listen, man, I'm selling supplements now. You need to get in on this. Oh, and you're like, man. I've had, I've, yeah, totally. I've had some well, really one or two high school friends that have reached out <laughs> out of the blue. I, I, I've had that. <laughs> has been, it's so funny that that definitely has been the case. That's just the general vibe that I get. It's either like, is it a pyramid scheme or is it a, is it, do you want a video made? It's going to be one or the other that you're going to ask me for out of the blue. I know you don't genuinely care how I've been all these years. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But oh my um, gosh. I will say like one strength of us of having done this for a while is mm -hmm. you learn how to say no. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You, it gets easier. Yeah. Yep. And then I'll say for me making YouTube videos, I get so many emails all the time from different companies wanting me to rep their products, make a video about their stuff, etc. And for a while I was replying to every single email, you know, every single email that was in bad English from a translator from a foreign yeah. country, like, will you review this tripod? And I'm like, no, like, <laughs> so finally I was like, I really need to stop replying to some of these emails and just like, these are clearly bulk emails. Why am I replying to them? And so you got to start saying no. And then oh, you feel man. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I've done is um, I have friends that have asked me to, you know, to shoot their wedding. Mm -hmm. But these are my friends. I know my friends. They're not, you know, they're not, yeah. they don't have, they don't have my, uh, they wouldn't be able to pay my budget. Mm -hmm. I mean, my rate. Um, and one thing I learned very early on in my career was to, um, is to not accept anything like if they, if they even want to give you like any sort of monetary gift for mm -hmm. doing them that favor. Yep. Don't accept it. Yep. Don't accept it because now you're subject to it's a, now it's an obligation. Mm -hmm. You know, one time I learned this with a two hundred dollar gift, and oh my god, that became a nightmare. Became yep. a nightmare. I did a quick little music video for a friend. This is really early on. Mm -hmm. And actually, not her, but her mom became a yeah. nightmare. <laughs> My mom was the one probably paying for it. So, uh, yeah. oh yeah, it was. It was her mom that gave me the, the the check. And you know, back then I was just getting started. I'm like, oh, I was, you know, I was doing it for free. But yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. She became a nightmare. <laughs> so now my friends ask me to do weddings. I'm like, you know what? That's my wedding gift to you. I will do. Go. I will. Do, I'll be there. Like I usually go as a guest mostly. <laughs> But I'll have my camera and I'll have it strapped and just walking around with a red camera, just a guest, just a friendly pretty, guest here, just pretty, document this and pretty, raw. Okay. There you go. <laughs> uh, and then the crane comes in. <laughs> Don't worry, no, that's over there. It's fine. It's just gonna be <laughs> swooping over during while you're walking down the aisle. It's pretty, very discreet. You yeah. won't even notice it. Yeah, it will it okay. will not take away from the day. But yeah, no, it's just uh, and that's probably that's what they see on my mm -hmm. I don't even know why I have that on my website. I really, <laughs> don't, I don't, I don't promote weddings really. Um, sure. I just, I mean, sometimes I'm like, okay, this came out pretty cool. Let me post it. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's pretty much it. You know, if somebody ever comes with a big budget, you know, I'm calling Matt Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm not, that's not what I do. Yeah, I don't know I, where to stand in certain times. Like it's no. And, and I'm with you on that. I feel like it's almost this, like if somebody asks you to do something, it is way better just to be like, no, I'm doing this completely for free because mm -hmm. then there's no pressure Absolutely. on you to perform. Yeah. And you can just be like, this is what I made for you. It's done. Right. And oftentimes, even if you're getting paid, it's it's not even worth your time. So it's like, no, I'm going to make my money from my real job, like doing yeah. this over here. Like, I'll, I'll do this for you yeah. for free. Don't worry about it. Yeah. And that works out better usually. And, yeah. And it helped out because on some of those weddings, I and just so happened, I ended up getting very busy. Mm -hmm. right after and I, I had to put that aside for a sec and you know they kept you know they very very politely you know they weren't very uh they weren't rushing me but they were very politely just asking uh what you know asking me hey i was just wondering i'm like yeah i'm sorry i'm just very very busy so i'll get to it but you know i didn't feel bad um and i know they have no leg to stand on to to try and you know rush me on that so um 
yeah, no, it's it's definitely uh, worth think considering at least yeah. when uh, when it comes to that, you know. Tell him, hey, I'll get to it when I get to it. I promise, yeah. I haven't forgotten about it. Yeah. Give me a year or two; it'll be fine. It'll it'll get there. <laughs> so, so when it comes to so, all right. So here's another thing I want to actually uh, uh, cover on this topic. Um, one of the things that another reason why I prefer corporate clients is because I can trust them, and I know that mm. that's that is very. It's tough to kind of believe some people may have had bad experiences. Thankfully, I've never had a bad experience. Actually, the only bad experience I've ever had was with an individual client that mm. ended up be disappearing on me. Yeah. But that was really my fault because I ignored all the red flags. Yeah. But besides that, um, when I work with a client, with a with corporate client, I look them up, I, I do research, I look mm -hmm. at their company, and it's not like they can up and disappear, right? Yeah. They have some trails. They know I know where I can find them. Um, it's funny because my 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 girlfriend always says, uh, make sure they pay up front and because <laughs> she's not in the industry. I'm like, look, it's not like Burke because Burger King takes forever to pay. And, mm -hmm. I, and she's like, Man, do you think that they're gonna uh they're not gonna pay you? I'm like, listen, if Burger King if Burger King's not going anywhere, regardless, going like through accounting, give it time, <laughs> they gotta like, you know. Yes, yes. And they tell me up front, it takes 60 days, it takes forever yeah. to pay, but you know, big companies, they, you know, they have their policies, you know, yeah. my experience with big companies usually like 60 days, but, mm. um, anyways, I, I, I trust, I never worry about, uh, clients paying me, you know, mm -hmm. really, cause I never had a real, yeah. uh, bad experience. Um, the only time, even then, like the only time I really ask for an upfront payment is whenever I have to put my own money, like whenever I have to pay for rentals and things like that. Mm -hmm. That required sure. to be paid up front, then yeah, that I'm going to need. And if I hire people, they're gonna yeah. have to pay me something up front. Uh, but other than that, um, I fully trust my clients. And again, we have a relationship, and I, and I talk to the people and and whatnot. And um, I've never had an issue. You mm -hmm. know, hopefully that, that continues that way. <laughs> uh, but um, I've never had an issue, and uh, with that, so in your part mm -hmm. for non-commercial for weddings and whatnot, what yeah. has been your experience with that? So, okay, I, I feel like there's two directions you can go mm -hmm. with wedding filmmaking. You can either, to make money, there's two directions you can go. You can either film a lot of weddings for cheaper prices, and then you're just like trying to like, you know, quantity, film enough, and then you're making enough money. Um, for example, you're filming uh, 50 weddings a year at $2,000 to make 100K per year. That's a thought. Um, on the other side of things, of not killing yourself, the side that I'm on, mm -hmm. uh, more of the luxury side, I would say, is you're filming significantly less weddings for more money, and you're mm -hmm. spending more time getting to know your couples and really create a film that they will love and appreciate that is you know, creative. Um, so one thing that we've been trying to do is we try to put a lot of time into getting to know our couples, getting to know them well. And that's from before we even book them. So we get an email, we talk to them on the, uh, we try to talk to them on the phone. And a lot of it is like kind of feeling them out. You know, you're like, Hey, are you, you know, is this couple cool? Like, you know, are yeah. they, cause you can, you can trust your gut. Like, you know, you can yeah. trust your gut if you're talking to a corporate client too, or anybody else for that matter. And like they start talking, it just sounds a little weird yeah. or it sounds a little off or Red like, flags. There are or like the emails you get are like, how much does a chuck cost? And there's no talk of like creativity. Just like, we just want to know pricing. You know, they don't have a big budget. Yeah. That's, there's <laughs> that's, a lot of, there's a lot of, red flags. yeah. There's a lot of universal red flags you're going to deal with whenever you're dealing with oh, video man, in general. Cool. People like, episode on that, man. They call it photography. You're like, no, this is probably not what you want. This is, <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm not who you're looking for. Right. Um, so, we uh, we're trying to be very selective with the couples that we're taking now and yeah. not that we're like, we hate you. We're not going to film your wedding or event yeah. or anything like that, but it's more like, I think that you'd be a better fit for this other person. Let me send right. you that way kind of thing. And, and you have so a that good network of, of wedding filmmaking. Exactly. And so that's managed to negate a, a large amount of the ridiculousness of like, you know, people that necessarily want to nickel and dime you or want to be weird. Yeah. about things and that's that's been really good you've been able to avoid that whole issue altogether yes for the most part like 
things still slip through the cracks, just like in corporate work too. You know, like you, once per year, once or, or once every two or three years, maybe you, you know, you're like, oh, we screwed up. Okay, like they got past all my barriers. I ignored the red flags, and yeah. now we're here, and just got to film it. Got to make it work. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And at that point, you're doing it. Hmm. But at that point, you're relying on your knowledge and your experience, and you're like, you're gonna get a great video, even if it's been hard for me to do it. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah, I've always thought that that was interesting. Um, that 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 aspect of it. It's just something about working with individuals, people that I know that this is coming out of their pocket. Mm -hmm. Whereas working with a corporation, even though I'm talking to someone, the company's not coming out of their pocket. You know, their yeah. company has a nice big budget to work with. And so, um, yeah, but the, the, you know, I, I like that point that you said earlier, actually the first point you, you said that there's less people in the kitchen, less people <laughs> that have to approve. That's actually, that would be very nice. Mm -hmm. Uh, that would be very nice, but yeah, unfortunately there's usually a lot of eyes that see it. Like, um, one, uh, one way, you know, going, sorry, you're going to say something. I will also say one other thing really quick. Um, in regards to there being, uh, you're, you're saying how corporate, you know, it's, there's a budget it's removed. It's out there. Like, okay. Yeah. It's separate from, you know, what you're making almost like they have the money for it. Um, I will say that if you get into more luxury weddings where it's higher in clients, what's crazy is that they'll have a $200,000 wedding or a half a million dollar wedding or a million dollar. It's this much higher level things. Mm -hmm. And at that point you're it's, it becomes more similar to like a corporate shoot than you would oh, think yeah. in the sense of like almost, you know, it's not necessarily the couple footing the bills. It's the bride's parents footing yeah. the bills right, right, or right. something like that where it's literally, you're just a line item on a very long list of like, well, we spent 50 K on flowers what's 10 K for video at this point, right, kind of right, or whatever. Right. And it, it, it's odd right, sure. in that, you know, you see people and you're like that ice sculpture costs more than their wedding. <laughs> video. You know, you're just like, dang it. What the heck? You know, it's, yeah. it's nuts, man. And so that's like the one situation I think where it almost becomes more removed like that, where it's just, right. what is money? What is that at this point? Like uh, whatever yeah. we want, like, Okay. Yeah, that's true. No, that's definitely true. And you see that in your career, whether it's corporate or commercial, like the, the quality of client that you get gets better and better and better. So um, that's pretty cool. Um, uh, I apologize. I have not said I haven't given a shout out to everyone that's joining us live. Welcome, everyone. Um, we do have a, a question here from Nice Guy. It's his name. Nice uh, Guy. <laughs> I, I think this one's mostly directed at, at you matt so it says um came in in three different posts so it says how do you feel about the surplus of video content and the decrease in quality due to this oversaturation oversaturation um he says i got started back in 2011 i took a break for a number of years to work to work it it's a, okay to work it now that i'm back uh doing video full time since 2017 everything has drastically changed I also hate filmmaking, but it's the only thing. How do you hate filmmaking? I also hate <laughs> filmmaking, but it's the only thing that I've been able to make a decent living on. What? Huh. I know a lot of people that would love to have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I don't know. What do you think about that? And I, I would like for them to clarify. What, what do you mean video content, surplus of video content? There's um, only... Uh... This question was only asked 30 minutes ago. We're a little late to the live stream. Hopefully they're still here watching. Hopefully they're still here. Was it asked? I don't see a timestamp on it. It's telling me it was 11, 11, 12 or something like that. Like Is there a timestamp on your side? On the, on the YouTube. I've got the YouTube stream open over here. Right, right. I don't see the timestamp. Chat. Right. I don't know. It's just down in the chat. Whatever. Well, if they're there, I would like a little bit of clarification. But yeah, seems, I don't know. It seems like they have a good problem to have that they can only make money. Well, in filmmaking i see what they're saying about surplus of video content decrease in quality that's a that's a constant refrain and you see it uh especially in video now because as more and more uh take take example photography like sure. everybody's a photographer now yeah. everybody bought a dslr or mirrorless they're like i'm a photographer now <laughs> and they're like everybody's doing photo i really feel and, bad for photographers. <laughs> 
And what's funny is that video is like only a few years behind photography in that. So like give it a few more years and everybody's gonna be like, everybody's doing video now, it's oversaturated. Uh, I hate it. And, and I, I, I'm sorry, I could not disagree with you more. I really <laughs> couldn't because he, here's the way that I see things. Um, yeah, I do feel bad for photographers because one frame is, you can shoot a really, really nice picture on your phone. I mean, you see billboards that were taken on an iPhone. Like you've seen that and it looks phenomenal. But for video, man, that gets way more complicated, way more complicated. Um, I, I just cannot, and there, there's just no way, and I can't even see an AI putting together, you know, maybe in 20 years, mm -hmm. but I, I cannot see the creativity of putting, you know, video and sound and lighting together and then editing it in a very cohesive, very creative form that is able to attract viewers and, and still be able to put a nice story together. Like, I don't know. I just don't see that. I, I can't see anybody faking that. That cannot be faked. I don't think that anybody, like, you could see, you could see somebody and see their work and see, and you could basically tell how experienced they are. You can't do that with photography. I mean, you can't do that with photography. Yeah, I'm right. You can't do that with photography. Photography, you can see two pictures, right? You can mm -hmm. see two pictures and I, I'll be honest, like I would, well, obviously the crazy professionals that <laughs> just are ridiculous. Yes, of course you can tell their, their, the, the, the images apart, but you can take two photographers, uh, two photographers, two images and, and basically not be able to tell who shot what you, you don't know if the photography, the, the shot was taken by a very experienced individual or someone that was just pointing a camera and hitting a button in sure. video. I don't see that that's the case. I can't, I really can't like everything from the camera movement to, to, you know, the, the perspective, whether it's in focus or not, things like that is just, man, I don't, uh, I, I, I can't see that happening. It's way too complex. <laughs> I'm with you on that. I think I think we'll see AI photographers before we see AI oh, video for a while. Sure. For a while, thankfully. I, yeah. I think they may get there and we're like, oh crap, we're out of a job yeah. now. Dang it. Okay. Yeah. But um I will say one one benefit and one thing that I've tried to really like hone in on, going back to like at least for me with wedding filmmaking, taking fewer clients and really getting to know them, like I'm getting clients that are booking me because they want me right, right. and my creative vision, my ideas, my thoughts. And so that really helps sure. because whenever couples want you, whenever somebody wants to book you Ariel for your creative talent and your video capabilities, no matter what you're charging, no matter the cost, no matter uh, what uh, you're requiring to be able to do your job, they will, they're willing to pay that because right. they want you. And that's really, really good. So I think right. I think it'll get there. Hmm. So I have a. Uh, huh. So I have somebody disagreeing with me. I love it. I love <laughs> the discussion. No, for real. It says Anthony and Samantha. Uh, and he agrees with you what you just said, but he's saying it's getting easier and easier with video, and people are caring less and less about the end result. I think you're wrong about photography as well. Well. <sighs> Like I said, like you can't take someone like I, I recently had on a podcast, uh, JP Morgan, right? His stuff is very unique. JP Morgan, a photographer, his stuff is very, very unique. You can't see his image and say somebody that has no experience shot that. Of course not. His mm -hmm. stuff is very, very good. That's not the person that I'm talking about, though. And JP Morgan is, is you know, how many JP Morgans are out there? They're, they're very, they're, okay, there's a lot, but. Compared to the people that are out there with cameras and pointing and shooting, you're not going to get somebody that that is just – I can't do what J.P. Morgan does. I can't even get close to what he does. You know, and I and I happen to think I, I can take pictures. You know, I can, you know, take some nice pictures. But um, in video, there's just way too many elements to think about. And even, even in that, that – interview that I did with JP Morgan, he even agreed that it's a lot harder for people to emulate good video. 
and he knows because he 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 that he does video too. It's a lot harder for people to do good video, like to fake good video. Does that make sense? So there's just way too many elements. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm not saying it's Huh? Getting content to wear Phil now and everything. It's going to yeah, just, no, it's, just it's, it's, post. It'll be fine. It's, make, it's making our job easier. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally. Uh, but what you said, I think what you said earlier was uh, a few years away. I would say it's more like 15, 20, a couple decades away. For, from, for video, yeah. For, for video. Photo. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it says, I guess what you're uh let's see i guess it's what you want to go after though true video is a lot harder and the more and the more you charge the better the client well yeah i mean yeah to, to, you could easily the cameras are getting better and better cameras mm -hmm. are getting obviously with these releases which by the way we're going to get into in a second <laughs> uh, yeah cameras are getting way better uh you you get your camera you get the gh5 you put that thing to to natural you're gonna get a beautiful shot you really are going to get a beautiful shot. Uh, uh, but the editing, the creative editing aspect of that, you could see the difference. Um, sure. But uh, it, it, you just can't fake that. You can't fake that. And obviously, and, uh, and another thing, last thing I'm going to say about this is that it doesn't only go off of the experience of the shooter, the editor. It also goes on the experience of the person that's looking at it too. Mm. Right, the people that really matter, the people that can see the difference, and there's some people that can't point specifically point what the, what's better about the video, but you know you color corrected that thing, you <laughs> color graded that thing, you know the flares that you added on there that they don't notice those small little things like that, and using it well, the music that you selected, the subliminal uh, beauty of your shot, your images, everything that you do. It's very unique, and that only comes with experience. You can't get yeah. an inexperienced person to fake that. It's just I don't think it's going to happen by pointing and shooting a camera. I'm with you. So that's my take on that. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, I'm not ragging on photographers. I, was, I, I, I have major respect for photographers. I just think that uh, I know some photographers that they're, they're struggling. They're struggling because people are just not willing to pay top dollar for, you know, a shot that they feel that they can get with uh, – you know, a Sony a6300, you know, a, a, a smaller end camera or even even their phone. But yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Kind of uh, shifted the subject there. <laughs> Good rant. I liked it. It was enjoyable. Yeah, that might end up being a social media clip. <laughs> Anyways, let's let's get into some gear talk, man. We've had some pretty sweet announcements. By the way, you're, you're still on. The A7S II, correct? Yes, I am. To much, to many people's surprise and shock. And <laughs> what are you hey, doing? Upgrade already? Only an experienced guy can. That's still a great camera. First of all, oh, I love it. That's still a really good camera. Yeah, I use it all the time. It's yeah. fine. Where is it? Oh, there, there you, you go. go. There you go. It's hanging out. Yep. So, what do you think about these new Sigma releases? So they came out today. Sigma has unveiled three new full frame lenses. A couple of Sigma Arts, a contemporary lens. They look really good. Tell me your Sweet. thoughts. They've been leaked for like a month now. So like I'm just like, when are these things coming? Dang it. I want to I want to get these things. I've just been reading about them. Also, oh, you've known about them. Okay. I, I mean, I've known. We could have talked about this a long time ago, man. No. Um, <laughs> I, I will say that I'm a big fan of Sigma. Uh, I my favorite lens ever is the Sigma 24 millimeter 1.4. Still on my camera right now. Um, one I definitely use the most, I would say. And I love the price to performance ratio that you get with them. Like it's just very sharp, very high quality lens for a surprisingly reasonable price. Right. And um, I think that them expanding especially with uh this uh where is it at? i think the the biggest thing for me would act okay everybody's going to talk about you know oh my gosh they have the uh flipping a 35 millimeter f 1.2 lens like that's you know okay we'll talk about that in a second what more excites me is the 14 to 24 millimeter zoom lens they came out with 
only because they have not made any zoom lenses for e-mount yet. And this is the first uh, zoom lens they made for e-mount, which gives, makes me think and hope that we're <laughs> going to see all of the other Sigma e-mount lenses, other Sigma art lenses that are zooms also come. So, so I, what's, yeah, what's the, uh, and I, I, I didn't read too much on this. What's the significance of this one? Uh, which one? The 14, the, the, the 14 to 24. Cause I have the 14 to 24 art. Is this an updated one or? Yeah, I I'm pretty sure. Well, it's a F 2.8 for yeah. a 14 millimeter F 2.8. That's, that's really nice. Um, I think they're pushing it definitely more for like astrophotography and things like that. You know, if you need that ultra wide angle, um, 14 to 24 is also part of like the lens Trinity. They call it, you know, like you get a 14 to 24, 24 to 70 and 70, 200. Yeah lenses you need like okay <laughs> whatever well well i'm saying that they already had a 14 to 24 yeah f 2.8 so, yeah i'm i'm not quite sure i have i just know it's only it's the ones for mirrorless so yeah this yeah. is specifically made for for mirrorless cameras so i think that's like the bigger difference there hmm. um interesting 14, yeah it's 1400 new item coming if somebody i feel like it's something that i should know about but <laughs> i don't um because i i really didn't uh constant max yeah everything here i don't know if they had it for so i have mine for canon e-mount mm -hmm. i don't know if they had already a sony e-mount version of it they did not um, no. and, it's, and it is a full frame yeah um but there has to be something else new about it because they wouldn't be advertising it as a new item. Sure. They're, they're saying it's got better lens coatings and things like that. You know, it's going to be Probably. sharper and better, blah, blah, blah. The main thing is that we're, we're finally seeing Sigma begin to focus heavily on mirrorless. So these, these lenses are only available for E mount and L mount, right? which, right. which okay. is a big deal. So you're, you're not going to see people with the, with their, uh, 5d4 for example their canon 5d4 with a 35 millimeter f1.2 on right. their camera for example stuff like that so it's interesting very very nice no and, yeah. I, and I, I like the my 14 to 24 it's really nice yeah i'm i'm pretty excited i'm not for you if you already have one you probably don't need another one <laughs> but, oh yeah i mean considering yeah how much i use it i i use it often but not yeah. enough to justify buying another one yeah i think this 35 millimeter f2 f1.2 is gonna be i don't know much like how nikon had their z mount uh or camera and it has the f.95 50 millimeter Ooh, oh my gosh it's crazy right, right. Like, that's the, i feel like this 35 millimeter f1.2 is going to be kind of the the one that everybody talks about and it's like oh Oh really? Okay. What was the one before? Was it like a one eight or one four? Oh, one four. Yeah. One four. But this one also has a aperture ring on it. Yeah, I see that. Is, yeah, that's very intriguing. You know, I feel like a lot of lenses these days are becoming hybrid for video too. Like the yeah. manufacturers are recognizing, oh, there is a one for that. Okay, we'll add that in. <laughs> yes, this is awesome. So. so the so it's not really going to, because it says E-mount mirrorless cameras, but you're going to have to. I wonder how many people prefer to uh, to change the aperture on the right, because it looks like it's clickable. Or maybe I'm just looking at it. I just see, I see the, I see the, the markings on there. It may not be clickable. It might just be a smooth ride, but. I'm not um, sure. Hmm. Interesting. I it enough. I guess more people like to manually change the aperture on the lens rather than digitally. I've j I guess I'm just used to doing it digitally. I, I do it all manually still. So, oh, well, <laughs> the, the aperture. Yeah. Yeah. So like I'll either like with my, cause this is a Nikon mount Sigma 24 millimeter on here that I've adapted to the Sony. Cause I bought this years before there was ever e-mount versions available. <laughs> Got it. And so I have a photo diox adapter that is a, Nikon E mount and it has this big blue aperture ring on it that I can rotate to adjust the aperture. Really? I really like that. Yeah. I'm a big fan. But it rotates the aperture on the lens itself? Yes. Correct. Really? The yeah, the Nikon mount lenses, they have this little 
can't really see it because it's really tiny, but they have this little <laughs> lever on them that lets you open and close the aperture there. Oh, is that? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, it's only for the Nikon lenses, but it's pretty great if you want to be able to adjust things like that. And are you able to tell exactly what you so you don't know what f stop you're at? <laughs> no, no, but in the I mean, world, you know, yeah. you know when it's open and completely yeah. open, like completely it's it a hard stop whenever right, it's open, right. and hard stop whenever it's closed. And well, whenever you're filming weddings, you're not like necessarily needing to, oh, I got to replicate this shot. Okay, set it to f 2.4 exactly, precisely. Like it's more so like that looks good. Okay, great. Like <laughs> moving on. So I'm looking at it, the man, the aperture ring can be declicked as well. So oh, okay. I believe you have the option of adjusting the aperture in camera. Usually, like usually, they'll let you do it electronically and let yeah. you then switch to a well, manual. That's actually, camera. that's actually good in case you need to change your exposure when moving outdoor yeah. to indoor or vice versa. I know that yeah. that's helpful. And digitally, you'll see each and every click, which is mm -hmm. very distracting. Yeah, I'm I'm very intrigued by it. I will say I'm yeah. like, really tell me more. Okay. So. Super interesting. Yeah. And now this uh hybrid, it looks like a cinema lens. <laughs> it totally the looks 45 like, millimeter. Yeah, the 45 f2.8. Yeah. Looks just I mean, it has the grooves mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to put a follow it's, focus. It's quite interesting because it's very small, much it smaller. Is. It looks yeah, it's 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 I, I feel like if uh, people are doing any sort of run and gun where they need something to look small and unassuming, you know, you put it you're, uh, you still have your full frame camera, but you put it on. It's real tiny and then it kind of hides away. You know, it's a little. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, this is just my little baby camera. I'm not shooting full frame 4K high quality <laughs> video. Don't mind me kind of thing. Huh. It's pretty, pretty cool. It has it has high speed autofocus. Yeah, it's interesting. This is a this is a <laughs> big time hybrid. Like the benefits of cinema of a cinema frame, with also the benefits of uh, autofocus and all that mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty neat. It's I, pretty I feel like interesting. Like I said, these companies they're realizing, oh, photo and video are important. Hold on, we need to talk about you know, we can do this here. And it's only five hundred fifty bucks for the forty five millimeter. That's not bad at all. Yeah, that's that's very cheap. Yeah. That's very cheap. And it's for what mount here? E mount. Uh, yeah, these are all E mount and uh I believe L mount as well. And all full frame. Wow. You're pretty like great. That, 40, that 45 yeah, is yeah. I know. This is I, okay, so switching slightly here, I will say that while the reason I'm still on the A7S2 mm -hmm. is because I assumed by this point the A7S3 <laughs> would be out. Oh. Just, you know, the assumption was okay, the A7 III was announced in that came out in like June last year. So I'm betting by, you know, October, November, we'll have an A7S III. Great. And that just never happened. Oh, and it still God. hasn't happened. And so I'm at the point now where. Panasonic's making some major moves, especially with the S1, and friends of mine love it. And so, with the especially considering that Sigma is making these new lenses that are for L mount, and something else is coming out soon. Yeah, and they're actually like of a decent price. I'm like, you know, <laughs> if Sony doesn't come out with the S, you know, with the uh, A7S III by like the end of this year, I'm going to be heavily considering switching over to Panasonic. Right, which you know, not not a not a bad, not a horrible thing. Ah, know, I don't think absolutely. that S one H is delicious, man. <laughs> and, and I, so I think I mean, I got, uh -huh. the S one they just came out with the the firmware update for it too, which adds a ton more features. Also, so either one, great choices. That's right, because man, they they've just been pushing and pushing, man. Mm -hmm. Insane. Yeah. They want it badly, and I feel like uh, Sony had a chance like a while ago with like, oh, hey, like, you know, if they came out with the A7S III two years after the A7S II, like if they come out within 2017 even, after the GH5, and they're like, hey, it's the A7S III is full frame and it shoots 4K60. Great, that's all they need to do. But now suddenly it's like, well, it needs to be 4K60, and it needs 10-bit, and it's going to need all these yeah. other features. And I'm like, pretty much. Good luck, Sony. Yeah. Hope, you, hope you do it. 
okay, we'll see. I mean, it'd be a huge outlier compared to all their mm -hmm. other products. Everyone that got the yep. A7 III is going to feel like, damn, dude, like <laughs> we got the A7 III because you took too long with the A7S yep. III. But now they come out, if they manage to pull it off, yep. all these people that bought the A7 III and any other camera, I, I don't know. I, I, I'd feel pissed. I'd feel pissed. I I don't know, man. I A7 III has already been out for over a year, and I am a I actually really like the A7 III. If I had known it was going to take this long for the A7S III to come out, I would have bought an A7 III. I would have upgraded because the battery life is so much better. The autofocus is better. Oh, yes. I totally forgot about that. <laughs> So it's I, been, I re it's been that long that I forget that the Sony uh -huh. Alpha cameras, at least the ones with the A7S two and yep. below, yep. are terrible. <laughs> From a battery perspective, for sure. I well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I rented the uh, I rented the A7 III, and I was like, well, let me get like four batteries just to make sure, like I can film a whole wedding day with it, you know, and then I bought or I rented the, from the company. They also had a uh, I rented a battery grip for it. And then I also rented, they have this quad Sony charger you can get that'll charge all four batteries, which I think that was really cool. So I'm like, well, I'll rent that too for an extra like 30 bucks. Yeah. I rent the whole thing. Turns out that the battery grip, so like the camera came with a the battery. Then I rented three more batteries just to make sure that I was okay. So I said, there's my four. Sure. But then the battery grip ended up coming with batteries and the uh, battery charger that I rented also yeah. ended up coming with batteries. So I want to say I had eight batteries. Wow. And I was like, this is so overkill. And the best part is I ended up using one and a half oh the entire God. wedding day. And I was like, why did I rent eight of these? And this, is, and this is with the A7 III? A7 III, yeah. Wow. Whereas, to put I mean, that perspective, I guess it's a good problem to have. No, you know, not, but, not a bad issue. Nice. I'll usually go through four batteries on my A7S II on a wedding day. Gotcha. Four to five. And so granted, my batteries are like four years old at this point, three sure. years old. So they're starting to get like more aged. And so they don't last as long. But just seeing that comparison to what it what it, uh, what the A7 III is capable of doing, I'm like, OK, Sony's new batteries are amazing. And that's awesome. Well, they made some improvements. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about this camera here, this new Sigma camera. Ooh, yes. <laughs> I know you were. Uh, I don't again. I don't know too much about it, so fill me in. We're here on the page. It's uh, at <laughs> Petapixel. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you're looking at literally, as they say, it is the world's smallest and lightest pocketable full frame camera. <laughs> and yeah, it's it's great because this hadn't leaked. Like all these lenses were leaked, and then uh, Sigma's also like, oh, by the way, we have this new camera, and they're like, what? Nobody saw this coming. Yeah, and so Sigma's always done weird cameras. They had their Foveon cameras, which have these crazy sensors that are better for photography. And I'm like, you never made anything for video with that. That'd be awesome. <laughs> but uh, it's it's weird to me because I, I'm looking at it, and I'm like, it's hard to tell the size of it, even looking at like photos of it, until you see somebody holding it. And it's definitely it's definitely quite small. Yeah. Um, it's I would almost view it as it's bigger than say like a black magic uh, original pocket or like a, uh, you remember that black magic micro they came yeah. out with and there was that really tiny little one that was modular. I almost view this camera as like a full frame version of that. Right. It, right. Only because yes, it's a little bit bigger, but it's really made to like have accessories put on it. Like, yeah, it has a screen on the back. You can use it just on its own if you want to use it that way. But I really feel like it's made for you to put a monitor on it. And to like, I do like an external recorder because right. they're saying externally it's capable of recording um, raw video huh. in Cinema DNG. Does it have which, an SDI connection? Uh, it does it through a USB 3.1 port. USB? Or USB, yes. Huh. Weird, but it works. So, so will you, how would you record that? What, um, how would you record that? <laughs> You're like, wait a second. Wait, does oh, it go directly to a drive and you just continue to see it on the screen? Or I'm, I'm not positive, actually. That'd be that'd be an interesting thought if you could just slap a SSD onto it, you know, and just be like, yeah, it's recording kind of thing. Um, <laughs> there, it's 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 definitely interesting, and I think that 
Sigma knows what they're doing. Sigma's interesting because they're showing the examples they show on their website are, are they're showing it's on a, you can put it on a gimbal if you wanted to. You could put it on a drone if you wanted to. You can build it up super big if you rig it up. Um, mm -hmm. They're saying it's only up to 24 frames per second in 4K, which I think for the size of it isn't horrible. But at the same time, it's like, come on, guys. I don't know. Let me see. 12 bit I raw video at 24. Thanks to the built in heat sink, the camera can capture 12 bit cinema DNG raw video at 24 frames per second, 4K to an external recorder through the USB 3.1 port. That's USB C. Um, it also features support for waveform monitoring, shutter angle control, and time codes. So, Sigma, oh my goodness. <laughs> But I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how would you record that? Yeah, I, I'm I mean, assuming I'm assuming that has to be a drive. Like, I can't slap on my Atomos recorder and, and You can't do that just through the USB? <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's interesting, man. I'm, I'm pretty darn intrigued by it. I think, uh, is it a camera that I would buy? I don't necessarily think so, I but is it a... Does that, Do they have a price on this? Anytime they're doing new stuff. Um, Is there? Let's see. I don't... I don't think there's a price yet. I haven't seen a price on here yet. I would like—is that a full full size HDMI cable uh, connection? Um, let's look here. I'm still digging I through. See a mic here. in? I don't see a headphone in. Clearly, we've done a lot of research on this beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're on the page. This is all the information they have. This is, this is it. This is it. Um, I don't see a a headphone jack on there. Can't use it for vlogging. Dang it. Dang it. Oh, that's interesting. They're pushing it as a director's viewfinder option. Let's you sim simulate different angles of view and how an image looks on cinema cameras. So you can put it up, you know, have it up, like be looking at it and see that's pretty interesting. Oh yeah, they're asking for a link to this camera. I'm gonna put a link on here on the on the chat room so you guys can go and check out what we're looking at right now and see for yourselves interesting i mean like you said maybe not for me but interested to, to find out the price on this though yeah i think that's gonna be really interesting the name of it is the fp the fp sigma fp all right yeah i like how they're using pocketable yes so World's there's no no pricing yet that I've been able to see, but it's definitely an interesting, interesting little guy. And <laughs> yeah, I think that it, it's funny because people are like, yeah, it's pocketable. And they're like, have you seen the size of L mount lenses? Like none of those Sigma, the 45 millimeter if you <laughs> cargo shorts, you can probably like wedge it down. And they're like, no, it's just mine. Yeah, 45, which which one was it that, that came out? It's funny. I, I saw uh, Jared Undone do a video on... I forgot what Sigma art lens that was just enormous. Oh yeah. They've got, was it a Sigma lens? Yeah. He did a thing about Sigma. I think it was, was it the, did you do the thing about 24 millimeter lenses or no 20? He did the 20, the 24 and the 35. I think one of those things was just enormous. It might be the 20 millimeter. I've, because I love the 24 millimeter f1.4, and I was thinking, well, if I love the 24 millimeter f1.4, I probably would love the Sigma 20 millimeter f1.4. Go a little wider. That's going to be great. That lens is like twice as heavy. It is just wow. a. It's like it looks like a fisheye in the front of it. You're like, here's my lens. Like it is. It is not a light lens. Would you have? Would you get? And uh, I'm always skeptical about prime lenses mm -hmm. and for I work just because I need to move fast and whatnot, but sure. would you get a 20? It, let's say it was the same price. Would yeah. you have a 24 and a 20 in your kit? I don't think so, no. Like, because I, I rented that 20 and then I was like, I don't ever want to own this. <laughs> it's <laughs> well, the size. Yeah. Let's say it's the same lens. Yeah. Let's say it's the same everything, whatever. Yeah. Would you have both? I don't think so necessarily. It's like from a, it's not uh -huh. different enough. Got it. Yeah. I I mean if I'm gonna buy something like I think I have I have like a sixteen millimeter, then a twenty-four millimeter, then a thirty-five millimeter. Like right. I want 
that's where I'm getting at. Like, man, that's too little of a difference to justify yeah. having two lenses, right? In my exactly. kit, that I would have to swap exactly. Back from. Now, the only lens that I would consider switching from the Sigma 24 millimeter would be the new Sony 24 millimeter E mount G Master lens they came out with because it's, it's like the lightest 24 millimeter you can get. That thing is tiny. Like it's it's very nice. You go for that that that's a big uh, thing for you. I like the lightness. That's that's nice. Um, I also, you know, as somebody that doesn't currently have autofocus capabilities with it, it would be nice to have two. But I'm waiting till I have a better camera with better autofocus first before I really stress about that too much. Yeah, um, yeah, I know your camera has it. Not as good as the A7R. No, but yeah, it's there. Yeah, it's interesting. I I remember, I, I think I only use autofocus when I'm shooting pictures. Mm, yeah. I don't typically do autofocus. Autofocus autofocus works great on the camera for photo. It's I have no complaints about it there. But yeah. for video, it's contrast-based. And so it's very like, what did you want me to focus on again? That over there? And you're like, I'm right here. It's like, ah, oh, okay. Like, if you turn on face detection, it's better. But even then, it's not a, not a guaranteed thing. Yeah. Um, not nearly as good as Canon's dual pixel autofocus or even the, the phase detect of Sony's new cameras that are quite good. Have you been able to play with the pocket 4k? I have not. No, I know that we saw that at NAB and we we're like, Ooh, this is really fun. Okay. I love that. I just didn't really get to, uh, get to mess with it too much. I, I think I have friends that use it and love it. Yeah. It's awesome. But yeah, I hear everyone saying such good things about it. They're doing a good job with it, man. They're sig or uh, not Sigma, but uh, Black Magic. They they know their market. And they know like how to sneak things in. Like, do you want this? And you're like, yes, thank you. Okay, <laughs> great. So it's pretty cool. That's good. That's awesome, man. Oh man, just nerding it out over here. Um, what did you think about the Panasonic S1H? I know we kind of skimmed through that. Yeah, yeah. With all, with all the specs. Mm -hmm. with it uh i i went broke just looking at the camera <laughs> just because i i like in my head i already bought it yeah yeah in my head um, <laughs> i want to say it's four grand i think is what they're targeting roughly something like that like four thousand four thousand so it's definitely not as cheap as other options but the main issue that i i i think that that I have with Panasonic's announcement is their weird method of like, Hey, we made this camera. It's coming out later this year. Uh, tune in for more info later on. And so like, they didn't announce like anything, some very critical things, right. but then they had it on the show floor and you could see those critical things right there. So watch the whole announcement. Loved right. it. Right. And they don't mention that it has a flip out screen. It has a full on flip around screen. And that would have been such a huge yeah, selling point. That would have been nice to, to know. Like, it's just weird to me because it's like people are going to know. They're going to see it on the show floor. And they're going to be like, yep, that's a flip around screen. But you could have mentioned it. Mm -hmm. So that was a, uh, okay. I will say that arguments for the S1H over the S1. Okay. Considering that it's almost double the price as the S1. S1, I believe, is 2500 This is like four grand. Yeah. Um, I feel like... The flip around screen is really huge. Like, I feel like that's going to help out a ton and a lot of people are going to want to buy it for that reason. Yep. Um, so that, that would put me more to the S one H I do not need six K, but I do love delivering video and videos in four K. So right. the option to zoom in, like, Hey, if there's an option, that'd be nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. I rarely deliver four K, mm -hmm. uh, but I always shoot four K. Yeah. It's rare for me to shoot HD. And that's Ugh. only that's only like conferences and things where like i really don't need it but yeah um I gotta, you gotta zoom in you gotta get those cinematic zoom yeah. the and zooms and posts on the conference that's speaker it. not only that and a lot of people don't make this argument like when you shoot 4k or a higher resolution deliver lower resolution um you get a ultimately sharper image yeah it looks when significantly you, better yeah and I, I don't i it's funny i don't hear people making that argument it's usually the the typical future proofing it and <laughs> and reframing it but nobody ever talks about how much sharper it is when you deliver even a normal resolution image which is i find interesting 
Yeah. But anyways, yeah, to be able, I mean, my Sony a6300, I still love that camera. The first camera I've ever purchased in my life was the Sony a6300. Uh, it has a 6K sensor, and deli but, you know, it gives you a 4K image. Mm -hmm. And it's such a sharp image. Like it's surprisingly sharp. Because it's uh, downscale. That downscale from 6K to 4K is real nice. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. It's beautiful, and I still love that camera. And now they have the A6400, and I'm like, ooh, I might need to put <laughs> those as a backup camera at some point. Yeah. That would be really nice to have. I keep, yeah, I keep thinking maybe I should upgrade it to the one with the uh, auto, I mean with the IS, but it's just not worth it. Like I'm not really putting in, it through too much work anymore. You're also at the point now where the A6500 has been out for several years to the point that it's they're going to have a new one soon. I'm betting, and then yeah. you might as well get that one. Even then, it's not even necessary. I gotta. I need to stop doing that because, um, yeah, I, I gotta kind of relax with the whole purchasing just because there's something better. Yeah, I need to. That, that's so dangerous. That's <laughs> so dangerous. Um, yeah, could do a whole other episode on that, but I got. I gotta keep buying stuff <laughs> on a need basis. Yes. Rather than want like sure all i have is a mavic air and i don't need anything better yeah this the dj mavic air and the a7s2 has been fantastic for me and in terms of sheer low light performance it still is the best camera mm. so yep. i i haven't there hasn't been a a moment that i'm like oh my gosh like i really need to switch to the s1 for example like it's going to be mm. perfectly better no it uh, I, 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 I'm still happy with where I'm at right now, but like I said, like it's been a while and I do want things like dual card slots. I do want things like, uh, 4k 60, even, mm -hmm. you know, with the S one, it's a, has a crop, for example, there's a lot of things I'm like, Oh, I want that. Okay. So yeah. I'm hoping. Do, do you find yourself, uh, there's been a couple of times where the dual card slots came in handy, but do you find yourself absolutely needing that or I, I mean, I've been shooting for years without it. It's more so for me, just especially with weddings, it's a one-time event. Yeah. You know, so you're like, oh, nothing messes up. And um, I've had like card issues before where I was able yeah. to recover files and things like that, you know, so it is like a fear. Oh, but, maybe, maybe yeah. if you use it, yeah, maybe if you use it for simultaneous recording. Yeah, stuff like that. Like that's yeah, appealing to me. Okay. As like an on camera backup, that would be nice. Otherwise, I don't think it's really like oh yeah. God. There's there have been a couple times where I've had interviews just go on forever, and it mm -hmm. basically swapped over to the other card, which I kind of don't like it when it does that. I don't like to split up the clips. I rather yeah. just stop and then start again. Yeah, on the new card. But, yeah, but sometimes you know it's like I mean, if you're filming a wedding, for example, like you don't. Yeah. Can you guys stop the ceremony? Hold yeah. on, I gotta switch. Like you can't. You know, it's 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 they happening. Pay me enough, so this is it. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> So, gotcha. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's the only thing that really turns me off about you know these Panasonic cameras is the mounts. Mm -hmm. But seeing these new Sigma lens options, I'm like, you know, I could, I could make this work. <laughs> I don't know. That's the reason I'm saying I'm going to wait till later on in the year because A7S3 comes out and I, it has a lot of the same features as a Panasonic. I'll go with that. But mm -hmm. A7S3 comes out and it either is lacking features or it's it just doesn't come out. So it's like, sorry, we've canceled it or something like that, whatever. Like at that point, then Panasonic's there. And I'm like, I can adapt lenses to L mount. I can make this work. And it'd be, I think I could, I, I could live with it and it'd be good. Right. Right. Man, we can talk about gear all day. <laughs> oh my god! Totally gosh. do this. Uh, dude, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, so, dude. Glad always, to be here. Always a treat. Um, Real quick, uh, just one more plug for well, well, where can people find you and all that stuff? And yeah, you know, yeah, definitely. Um, if you if you type in who is Matt, all one word, it basically comes up everywhere except for Twitter because there's another guy who has it on Twitter. But uh, otherwise, like anywhere you type in who is Matt, I'll come up. Who is Matt.com is my website and blog. That's also uh, where you can get a link to my course, Wedding Film Framework, or you can just go to WeddingFilmFramework.com, or you can click Ariel's link, which is an affiliate uh, link, which will help him out. So Use my link. Use my link. I get like 90% of the profits. Uh, <laughs> you could find it in the show notes for this episode. 
over at ifilmmaker.tv along with links to all these new cameras and lenses from Sigma and everything else we spoke about. Uh, but yeah, you can find out all that there. Uh, Matt, thanks so much for stopping by. Yeah, glad to be here, man. It's been a lot of fun. Today was a great episode. It was a fun one. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you to everyone that was interacting on our live chat over here. You guys uh, were a lot of fun. Thank you for the interaction, for the disagreements, and for the conversations. Appreciate that. So until next time, we'll see you guys on another episode. Later. Bye.